four, one. <laughs> Welcome, viewers, to episode 65 of the ForensicWeek.com show, brought to you by Forensic IQ Incorporated. I'm your host, Tom Moriello, CEO of Forensic IQ and professor at the University of Maryland Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice in College Park, Maryland. Tonight, Forensic Art Communication, Making Lemonade Out of Lemons. We have a return guest to ForensicWeek.com, Sandy Enslow. Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office Forensic Artist and Illustrator. It was episode 46 when we first introduced Sandy and she addressed, she addressed the role that the forensic artist plays in the identification of victims and suspects. Now, if you haven't seen episode 46, I suggest that after you see tonight's show, go back there because we're not going to repeat all the wonderful things we learned about the forensic artist. Um, we want to continue the discussion. Tonight, she will be discussing a recent case she was involved with that will illustrate the dynamics and success when using her forensic talents. Our producer this evening is Laura Pachuki. Laura is a graduate student from the George Washington University's Department of Forensic Science. And we have in real life reporter Whitney Silva. She's a University of Maryland Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice PhD student. And this evening we have a new member of our staff, a University of Maryland undergraduate student, Jamal Francis. Jamal, welcome and tell uh, our viewers a little bit about yourself, where you come from, your major, and what, what your career goals are. Sure. Um, I'm Jamal Francis. I'm a senior here at the University of Maryland. Um, I'm studying sociology, uh, but I tend to have a knack for photography and videography. I enjoy doing that. Um, and I'm originally from Baltimore, Maryland. Very good. Way up to Baltimore. Okay, very <laughs> good. Uh, folks, you're watching ForensicWeek.com, a talk show that features real forensic science by real forensic scientists, educators, law enforcement, and legal profession for professionals who find, collect, and examine forensic evidence in the performance of their duties. Broadcast live on your desktop and mobile devices by weekly on Thursday evening, 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on your YouTube channel, www.forensicweek.com. We are a proud member of the Hangout10.com live TV webcast network, which is a series of shows just like this one, brought to you live using Google+, Plus, a social networking service. Now, before we introduce our topic and our guest, uh, a couple of things. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, episode 63, you may remember we learned about forensic lexicology. Lexicology being the study of words and how words become an identifier uh, to an individual. You may remember our, uh, our special guest, Daryl Durrell. He wrote a book called uh, Financial Forensics, Body of Knowledge. And as you can see here, uh, uh, he sent me a copy, autographed, and I sent him a copy of my book, so it was a good exchange. I mention that because, you know, because of that show, because of what I learned about forensic uh, lexicology and the, the capabilities of that science, um, Doral uh, is now uh, involved in a cold case uh, investigation that I've been involved with for the last year and a half or so, uh, and he's doing some analysis of some documents uh, for that case. So again, uh, everybody's learning from this show, especially me. I also got a, a copy of his uh, of the book he mentioned, The Secret Life of Pronouns, What Our Words Say About Us, and this is a cool book. It's uh, written by Dr. James uh, Pennybaker, who starts telling us about why people use certain words, not only pronouns, but prepositions and, and two-word and three-word and four-word phrases and uh, 
the fact that their sentences have a certain amount of, uh, of words in them and certain sense, sentences within paragraphs. It's a really cool book uh, uh, with a very boring title, The Secret Life of Pronouns, but uh, I'm learning a lot, and I want to thank uh, Daryl Durrell for uh, introducing uh, uh, the whole subject in uh, uh, that reading to us. So if you're interested in learning more, you got to get his book, Financial Forensics, Body of Knowledge, in Dr. Penning, uh, Baker's book, The Secret Life of Pronouns, What Our Words Say About Us. Um, something else that just happened this week, uh, I just uh, have a new client. Uh, I will be uh, giving uh, forensic science presentations on cruise ships. Um, I just... Uh, um, got an approval from this company that provides specialty su special subject speakers on cruises uh, and uh, I'll be talking about forensic science and different aspects of forensic sciences with my wife uh, and I'm looking forward to doing that uh, really cool I'll tell you more about that as it goes along and especially after I do my first cruise maybe we can do one of our shows right on uh, on the ship and um, I, I gotta make sure that our guest this evening knows a little bit about that because she might be interested also. Laura, tell our viewers um, how to ask questions and how to make comments uh, so uh, they can get as much as they can out of the show. All right, thanks Tom. Hi everyone and thank you for watching the ForensicWeek.com show. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future shows, please email us at ForensicWeek at gmail.com. If you're watching this show live and you have a question for one of our guests or um, for one of us, you can use the comment box below and we'll bring that up on air. You can also tweet us at Forensic Week. If you like this episode, please click the subscribe button on YouTube. You can watch all archive shows 24-7 online at ForensicWeek.com. You can also find us on Facebook by searching the ForensicWeek.com show. And that's it. Back to you, Tom. Thank you. Uh, just so you know, Jamal, uh, our new uh, student working with us, one of the th a couple of things that he's going to be doing for us is going to make it a little bit easier for you, one, to know what's happening, to be able to ask questions quickly. Uh, um, we're going to create a ForensicWeek.com um, page out of the Forensic IQ uh, website that you'll be able to go to. We're going to break down all the, uh, the different uh, episodes into various content categories. Uh, and you, we'll have our, the schedule of all our future shows there. So rather than when you go to www.forensicweek.com, rather than going directly to the YouTube channel, it's going to go to a page. You can get any information you need. If you want to just go right to the show, it'll tell you where to click, and it'll bring you right there. Uh, so Jamal is going to be doing a number of things. He's going to be helping Laura with the uh, uh, producing the show. So we're really happy to have him. And I have to thank uh, uh, Whit Whitney Silva. Um, of the show for introducing us to Jamal because Jamal is a student of hers this semester and she mentioned hey I've got a guy with a lot of skills and he's interested so uh, uh, great to have you Jamal uh, and thank you um, Whitney. Let's introduce our guest. Sandy is a graphic arts coordinator and a forensic artist uh, for the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. She has been with them for over tw uh, over 20 years, probably closer to 21 years, she has sketched well over a thousand composites and testified in court hundreds of times. Her efforts have directly contributed to the conviction of hundreds of felons. She lectures at the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department Homicide School in mm -hmm. Detective College. She co-manages the uh, LinkedIn Forensic Artist Discussion Group, which has a membership of over 200 and 50 national and international professional forensic artists. And she is in a, a member of the general section of the American Academy of Forensic Science, uh, where uh, she and I both uh, met uh, over a year ago. Sandy, thank you so much for being with us here again. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you all for uh, having me back. Um, I really appreciate being here, and I think that you guys have um, a really great show. Thank you, thank you. Well, we're going to have a great show this evening. As I mentioned to our listen, uh, our viewers uh, at the beginning of the show, if you haven't seen the first episode with Sandy, which was episode episode 46, after this show, you got to go back there and watch that because she talked a lot about the background and the foundation of a forensic artist. We're not going to repeat that, but Sandy, I would like you to just start off by. Uh, 
Uh, just letting them know quickly about the career field of a forensic artist without going into the detail we did last time, but just a big picture, and then we'll begin talking about the case uh, in question. Sure. Um, first and foremost, uh, the majority of people who do this work do it as a collateral duty for either a law enforcement agency, um, a coroner's office, maybe an educational institution of some sort, um, and there are a small group of us, there's probably about 30 full-time units with about 55 to 60 uh, forensic artists, that's an approximation, that work in those units that, um, that do this full-time, and I'm the manager of one of those out here in Los Angeles for LA County Sheriff. I have um, two forensic artists and one graphic designer who are um, um, uh, my direct reports. Now you're a civilian um, for yes. the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, correct? Correct. Uh, what percentage of the forensic artists across the country um, are uh, civilian versus um, a uh, commissioned police officer? You know what? I don't know. In, in many instances, it just depends on the agency. In my agency, uh, those items are all civilian items, but they weren't always. And in some agencies, they, need, they, they determine that they want sworn officers doing the job. So it just depends on the agency, the region, what they're, what they're wanting to do. Okay. So I, don't, Very good. I don't have a percentage for you. Okay. Um, Last time you were on the show, you were talking about a case, and you said, listen, this is a, a real good case. I don't know if it's ever going to be solved or not, and I really can't get into any details because it's still an open case. But now um, it's it's no longer an open case, and you can talk about it. And, and I really would like to spend a, uh, a good deal of the show this evening talking about it so our listeners will truly understand the real practical application of what you do and how it it fits into an investigation. So why don't you uh, uh, start off by the first time you were introduced to uh, this case at the hospital. I guess that would be the first time you were introduced to it. Is that correct? Yes, that is. When I got the call to uh, go down to Harvard General in uh, the Carson area in southern part of uh, L.A. County. But I'd like to make a one more point about this unique case is that um, it's a very typical case. I just used the word unique, but it was typical in that DNA is going to solve this case. The composite drawing did not solve this case, which is a fairly common occurrence. Fingerprints, DNA, something else. So um, as we go along, I get a call uh, from detectives out of the South Los Angeles station to go and meet with a rape victim. And that's all they told me. They needed me to come down to the emergency room, which I did. And I walked in to find a woman who was badly beaten up and um, her jaw was broken and it was off to one side of her face in pieces. She could barely talk. And I'm looking at her and I'm very nice and quiet and hello, how are you? And I'm the forensic artist. I'm going to draw. We had two suspects. You know, one drawing for me takes about two hours. And, um, and I, I draw quickly. There are many artists that take a much longer time frame. Um, but um, so we're talking about four hours right off the bat. I don't know what they're going to do with this kid because I don't know what's going to happen with her, if they're going to pull her into surgery or something else is going to go on. And as it turns out, as far as the broken jaw went, they had to give it a few days to let everything kind of calm down and before they started to put stuff back together. Um, how, long, how long after uh, the rape occurred were you talking with her? Oh, probably within four hours or so, maybe less. I don't really know. Is it important for you to speak with a victim or a subject that you're going to do a sketch on as quick as possible or does the memory fade with time or does it matter? It's helpful if you can get there within a, a, a fairly reasonable amount of time. 
But sometimes you can show up to the hospital and they're in such trauma that you they just need to get wheeled into surgery and you need to sit down with them later. Memory is an amazing thing and individuals are all different. Um, so there is no hard and fast rule on that. I don't okay. mean to be vague, but I'm just saying. Okay. So um, I took a look at this woman, young woman, and um, I said, excuse me. And I walked out with the two detectives and we went down the hallway. And I said, what the Sam Hill are you thinking? She can hardly talk. How is she supposed to uh, give me a description on two, two different suspects? And they're saying, you know what, Sam, that's not our problem. We, we don't have anything. We ain't got nothing on this. We need you to get us something. So at that point, you have to step outside the box and start working on, on just whatever creative juices you have. And I walked back in to this woman, and she looks up at me, and she's in a hospital bed, and she's bloody, and she's all wrapped up in some of this blanketing. And I said, do you know how to draw? And her eyes got really big, and she said, you know, like, hey, you're the one that's supposed to be drawing, not me. <laughs> and she kind of shrugged her shoulders, and uh, that's, the, that's, that's the, the invitation I took. I gave her the pad of paper, and I said, we're going to start on just suspect number one, the first suspect, and I want you to give me a drawing of him. And she did, and she could talk a little bit as she went along. She gave me a drawing, and I don't know, Laura, if you want to put that drawing up or if you can. Yeah. But that is, um, that's the rough drawing that she gave me. And I took that and said, thank you very much. And I stepped away and I found a quiet spot in, um, in this uh, really busy emergency room. And I sat down and I developed a drawing. I then went back to her. Can yes. I ask you, why, why is one eye missing? Because, because she is not a professional illustrator, number one. Number two, she's in a lot of pain. Um, she's trying to develop something for me. And um, quite frankly, she had a lot of defensive wounds. You know, her hands, her arms, she was just pretty beat up. Okay. And, um, so I came back with a drawing. She made changes to it. I asked her to use the pencil to point and make changes. I adjusted the drawing. If Laura, you want to show that along with the um, with her illustration, you can or not. It's okay. And um, and one of the things that she just you know indicated was um, the chain, the wife beater. Uh, she talked about his. Um, his eyes and these cat eyes that he had um, and the heaviness of his brows so that's the drawing that I did and there it was we then went back and I said yes I got I gotta ask you if uh, Laura yeah. if you could bring that uh, her her uh, sketch up is that sketch done completely freehand or are you using software uh, to help help uh, create the final uh, sketch. No, that is freehand. That is a that is a hand drawn illustration. No, you did I will, that. You did, I that. did that. Yes, sir. I you did are that. Good. You are Thank good. I you know I've been at this a long time, and um, this is part of it is that there are many many people out there just like me, and we we draw. We put out, you know, it garbage in, garbage out. You got to put the best image out there that you possibly can under the circumstances you've got. And sometimes we, as forensic artists, get terrible circumstances that we have to draw under. So when I finished this illustration, I went back to her again. I gave her the pad of paper, and I said, "Now, suspect number two, show me the drawing." And and Laura, if you can put up suspect number two. One of the words that she used was horse face, that he had a long horse face. And it's like, wow, okay. So I went back, found my quiet corner, shoot out a nurse or two and said, hey, no, no, this is my spot. You're out of here. And, um, <laughs> and I just uh, developed a secondary drawing. And Laura, if you want to show that. And again, I made changes for her. 
she asked me to make changes and um, I developed that that illustration how many times did you have to make changes uh, go back and no, forth I, I don't her. really remember it was a long time ago this was in um, I think 2011 uh, yeah it was 2011 and mm -hmm. um, and I always wondered about that but I took these two drawings back to my to my office and I do scan them in I pull them into Photoshop I clean up any thumbprints, any markings on it, and I get them ready uh, as a JPEG, and I ship them out to the detectives. You know, and and who were waiting? They're they're waiting for these things. They're going to put them out. They're going to send them out to uh, Operation Safe Streets OSS and the Get Teams, the um, gang enforcement teams. Um, they felt that these were probably gangsters, and that certainly was what she had characterized. Um, and um, these guys were up for a lot of counts. Uh, they kidnapped her, raped her, a gun was involved at one point. There were other counts. I'm not going to go into all of it, but um, you know, it was some pretty serious things. And they were very interested in trying to track these guys down before they picked up somebody else. At any rate, this case went cold, and I never heard any more about it. It was the first time that I had utilized. Um, a witness's drawings in with mine in order to get something done. For, this and is the first. Uh, how many? So, in the thousands of composites you did, this is the first time you actually had a victim provide you with something like that. You know, I've I've had some some victims that might come forward, especially children that will draw, or they draw during the during the um, the process. Mm -hmm. But this was the first time that I started with nothing because of her injuries, just trying to get, uh, you know, we, I just couldn't do it the traditional way. And I needed to um, really give her the opportunity to um, draw. And she stepped up to the plate and she hit a home run. She really, she really did. So... Um, so this was the only evidence that the, uh, the investigators had at this point besides, uh, I, I would assume they did a, a medical legal examination of the uh, right. victim. Did they have DNA? Um, they, they did. They had okay. DNA, but it didn't go anywhere. There was okay, no so hit on it. There was no hit uh, in, the, um, in the database? Right. So... Okay. Uh, you know, and, and, and South Los Angeles Station is a pretty active station, and I'm down there often. So I would always go into the detectives and say, hey, you know, did anything happen? I would talk to the detective. She would just shake her head and say, no, that's cold, it's gone. We, we don't have anything on it. And, you know, I kind of let it go, but I, I never, I, I always wondered about the victim and, um, and the drawings. You know, it was just a, an interesting, it was a really interesting case from that end of it from how we started. And then in, um, boy, I think it was April, April 2014, I got a subpoena. Now, I, I get subpoenas a lot, and I go to court a lot. And I didn't recognize this case, and I called up the DA, and the DA was just all excited and just, you know, she was saying, Sandy, and Laura, if you want to show uh, Moreland the first one, you can show the comparison between the victim's drawing, my illustration, and then the, the photograph. This is a booking photo, and I can show you this booking photo because this is an adjudicated case. This has um, gone, to, uh, gone to court and um, is, is now. And, you know, when you're looking at this illustration, does this look exact? No, it does not. Does it look... Um, uh, is it in the ballpark? Is it close? Yes, it is. And um, and it was significant. And then, Laura, if you can show the second one, which is Adams. Uh, the illustration. And this one gets even closer, which is, you know, just kind of amazing. The length and the eyes, uh, the nose, the shape. You know, I'm really looking at my witness to be sincere and honest, tell me what they saw, and try to remember. And we we go through a process, 
And uh, these were, she, I, I give the credit to the witness, to the victim. She hit a home run. So when the when the victim saw your your well I won't call it your the final uh, illustration but the final f while you were at the hospital uh, was it going, yeah did she did she physically show emotion that hey you've got it that's him kind of a thing I don't remember her having any kind of an outburst or breaking down crying and some some witnesses and victims do. But, um, you know, she had a lot of injuries. She had a lot of stuff going on. So she was trying to hang in there with me. But she was satisfied. She looked at these drawings and said, that's it. We're done. I'm finished. And it's like, okay. 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 Uh, Laura, put either one back again. I, I, I really want our viewers to get a sense of how you approach this. You, you got this, um, this, this first draft from the victim. Uh, what kind of questions did you ask her to ultimately come up with the final um, composite that you have there? I mean, do you talk about shape of face? Uh, you're focused on the eyes, the lips, the nose. The, uh, what is it that you're looking at? Well, in this particular case, I'm looking at her illustration. This is what makes this drawing very, you know, kind of very unique is that she just remembered some of the strong images of these two men and in this particular case for Adams it was very a long face the heavy brows uh, the length of nose um, the ears she had the ears kind of sticking out quite a bit more she never made me change those ears I mean they stayed um, sticking out more more than what Adams actually has but um, you know, uh, but she, but she remembered those things. Now, she, now in the in the composite drawing, he's clean shaven, but in his booking photo, which is years later, he's wearing a mustache and and a goatee. But in reality, it isn't a short. You know, he wasn't arrested just a week later. He was arrested. You know, we drew in 2011, and he was arrested in 2014. Um, both he and Moreland were 17 and 18 respectively when they did this crime and then they were 20 and 21 uh, when they were arrested approximately very good all right what, um, what I'd like to do is give you a little little break and when we come back um, I, I want to talk a little bit about did you by the way did you testify in this case I did okay uh, I, I want to hear a little bit about uh, your testimony, what kind of questions are being asked by both the prosecution and the defense uh, to get a sense of uh, of the interest of both sides of the criminal justice system, if we would. Uh, but meanwhile, um, for, uh, I'd like to uh, bring uh, uh, Whitney Silva uh, into the show and uh, do her in real life um, segment, uh, talk a little bit about a current case that that relates to our subject here and uh, she may have some questions for you Sandy so your rest isn't going to be too long so don't think you're, you're going to be able to go somewhere and come back okay um, Whitney hi everyone so hey. today's in real life segment is going to explore uh, Jesse Matthew Jr. and if you've been following the news you probably know that this young man has um, been quite active uh, over the last decade or so in 2003, he was the suspect uh, in a sexual assault at Christopher Newport University, where he was a student, I believe, for only two months. Um, these are all in Virginia. These are all in Virginia, right, Whitney? These are all. Okay, these are all in Virginia. Yes. Okay. And in 2005, he was also a suspect in a Fairfax, Virginia rape. Um, in 2009, he became a suspect in the. Well, actually, later on, he became a suspect in the murder of Morgan Harrington in 2009 and she was a Virginia Tech student and then most most recently he became a suspect in the 2014 disappearance of Hannah Graham and the reason why I chose this case is because uh, in 2009 when Morgan Harrington disappeared and uh, we later found out she was murdered uh, Jesse Matthews was a cab driver and his co-workers at the time saw the forensic sketches circulating around 
and they joked about it and they said, whoa, dude, that looks a lot like you. And they said sometimes he just brushed it off. Other times he got visibly upset and stormed away. And it's um, ironic that it wasn't until years later when he was uh, identified via DNA uh, that these sketches began to resurface. And so, Laura, if you could put those sketches, that composite photo up, I'd like to ask Sandy a couple questions. Sure. She's got it up. Okay. So, Sandy, I'll ask you. Um, the first question is, uh, how good uh, of sketches are these? Are these pretty good sketches to you? Um, without regard to what he actually looks like, what would you think if you just saw these sketches? Well, first of all, I don't think that these are sketches. These are not... I, these don't look to be hand-drawn uh, sketches at all. These look like a computer composite drawing, which is very different from a hand-drawn sketch. Um, but let's step away from that and just take a look at uh, the overall, um, you know, look, the nose especially, the width of the mouth, uh, you know they look uh, very very similar um, in the in the photograph of the suspect and I believe he still is a suspect you know you're innocent until proven guilty um, he's got a lot more distance between the eye the eyebrow and the eye and um, the width of the forehead looks pretty darn good to me um, you know overall but no, whether it's a composite that's a hand-drawn composite or whether it is from a computer program, it's it's not. Um, and again, I don't know who did these. Who did these uh, people? Uh, but this looks like a computer program. Um, um, Sandy, let, well, let's let's talk about that. Some okay. of them are portraits. Let's assume this is a computer program. Sure. Um, do artists use? Uh, do you have to be an artist or have the talents of an artist like yourself to use a computer program, or could you learn to use a computer program fairly effectively and not have the skills of an artist? Well, the skills of an artist are are go well beyond just picking up the pencil and putting graphite on paper. You really do need to understand the landscape and the architecture of the human face and the nuances this is where it makes it very difficult with a program because you, whoever you are as the operator of the program you're limited to whatever program that that um, whatever that program features are so um, so, a I, so a program has listings of various type features, and you and you basically are, are limited to what the the software gives you. Is that is that what you're saying? That's correct. Generally speaking, that's the that's the case. Mm -hmm. um, um, I so know. I when, anytime question. I ask you for percentages, you 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 don't give them to me. So I'm. But but let me just say, I just got to get a sense. Sure. Um, of of all the sketches being done out there. Do you have any sense of what percentages are using software now versus um, uh, hand drawings such as yourself? You know, something, I, again, I can't give that to you because nobody checks in with me, and it's just, you know, it, it's not one of those things. If it's a smaller agency and they're limited with their resources, they may try one of these computer programs. Um, they are not the most satisfying, and many, many um, uh, witnesses are frustrated with the process because it doesn't look all that lifelike. These images that, that Whitney put up were not so bad, um, but I've seen some pretty horrific stuff. So, um, for the most part, most agencies do try to get a working professional, either get somebody trained up or they borrow somebody from a larger agency up that will extend professional courtesy. Okay, Whitney, uh, the sketches that you presented to us—did uh, the police use that to uh, that 
did, did that bring them to the attention of, of uh, Jesse Matthews? Uh, do you know? No, it wasn't until later that his former co-workers came forward and said, oh man, when we saw those sketches back way back when, we thought maybe this could have been him. So they saw the sketches, they thought it might have been Jesse, they knew Jesse Matthews, is that what you're saying? Yeah, he was a cab yeah. driver, right. and the police were questioning cab drivers in the area, and mm. they joked around and said in 2009, oh man, that looks like you, and apparently there was a few instances where, um, where they joked like that. And That's then right. once this new case uh, emerged, they said someone contacted the police department, I guess, and said, oh man, we remember these sketches, um, we think that was him back then. So. Okay, very good. Uh, and just so you know, Sandy, um, the University of Virginia student, uh, Hannah, what's Hannah's last name? Uh, Graham. Graham. Hannah Graham, still, her, she still hasn't been located uh, yeah. at this point, and they have, uh, they have Jesse Matthews in custody. Uh, thank you, uh, Whitney, for bringing that uh, to uh, our attention. Uh, we have with us... Uh, uh, another new student, uh, Mercedes Quick. Uh, Mercedes is a University of Maryland student, uh, criminal justice major, former student of mine uh, in my forensics class, and now doing an internship with uh, Forensic IQ. Uh, she will be uh, uh, putting uh, articles in the Forensic IQ blog, and, be re and she'll be reporting uh, cases are stories and training that she finds out about uh, for those of you here we call it forensic IQ uh, uh, update uh, Mercedes how are you today is your, I'm good. How is your are microphone you? on very good Merce yeah can you hear me uh, very good Mercedes uh, you had a um, you have a couple of uh, articles in, uh, in the blog I just want to mention a couple uh, uh, one was um, which is something that body parts forgotten in crime lab over seven years. Tell us a little bit about that. And uh, of course, remember, um, viewers, you can get all the details uh, about any of the stories that Mercedes uh, reports to us uh, in the Forensic IQ uh, blog. Uh, so tell us a little about how they found uh, body parts after seven years. Well, when I was reading the article, it talks about how... Can you hear me okay? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, when I was looking at the article, it's talking about how they were moving facilities and they came across a bag of bones that were... body parts that were left there. Um, they have identified who it was, but they don't know why it was left and why no one has found it. Uh, in, in the blog uh, you mentioned, and again this happened in Delaware uh, State Medical Examiner's Office, uh, you mentioned that a judge was ready to possibly throw out 200 plus drug cases. How does the drug cases relate to this bag of bones? And we just may have lost her. So um, I, we're having a little, diff uh, little technical difficulty with Mercedes, so uh, um, we will g carry on. But uh, I will say, and Laura, uh, you, if you would please put uh, the blog up. For those of you who want to learn more about some things going on this week, uh, besides this particular story, University of Florida has partnered with the Florida Crime Scene Investigation Academy. Um, to uh, have student interns work with them to learn uh, to, um, to process crime scenes. That's a, a good story to hear. Um, Forensic Science Solves Mystery of Richard III's Death. They actually found bones, uh, found his body, the bones of his body, underneath the parking lot of Richard III believe it or not, and they used uh, CT scans and micro CT imaging uh, to do that. So a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, Houston Forensic Science Center has been awarded $1.26 million grant um, uh, where they'll be able to uh, um, create uh, uh, new uh, sections of their laboratory. 
Now, how they actually got that 1.26 million in some of you who are out there who might say, hey, I'd like to have 1.26 million also uh, to increase our crime lab. Uh, just go to the Forensic IQ uh, blog and uh, you'll find that story. It's entitled Houston Forensic Science Center has been awarded a $1.26 million grant. You can learn more about, more about that. You can read Mercedes Abstract and then you can go right to the, uh, the full story and l learn more about it. Okay, let's get back to Sandy. And uh, by the way, uh, Jamal, uh, Laura, and Whitney, please, if you have any questions for Sandy, um, feel free to do that. Um, so they eventually arrest these two folks and uh, you, you mentioned that they they conducted a medical legal examination of the victim they collected DNA and various other trace evidence but there was nothing in the DNA database back then right. obviously something changed tell us what happened well, uh, they had a DNA hit. Uh, these young men continued uh, their crime sprees in, in other activities, and um, eventually their DNA uh, got into the system, and when it did, it, it hit on this case. So these detectives suddenly had an open, active investigation with... Um, um, uh, with uh, to to go forward with and prosecute these young men, um, so the DNA is what hit and it put it all together. It identified them. I want to give a really great credit to the uh, uh, the detective team and to the deputy sheriffs who actually had to go out and and arrest these guys. So uh, they did a really great job and. Um, uh, 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 District Attorney Hicks, it out of the Torrance Court, uh, did the prosecution, and um, these young men had uh, uh, they didn't have a public defender. They had uh, private attorneys that came in. Their family, you know, put up money for them to uh, get a really good defense, and and they were um, both convicted, correct? They were both convicted. Yeah, and these. Um, these young men, um, they're now 20 and 21, um, they're going to spend the rest of their natural lives in jail. And right. they've harmed not only their victim, but their families. And, um, you know, and, and it's, been a, it's been a really hard thing. For Moreland, um, his, he was raised by his maternal grandmother. Moreland's mother committed a homicide and is in jail serving 70 years for that homicide. So the grandmother went through one trial for her daughter and then she had to turn around and and go through another trial. This was extremely hard on her for her grandson. Absolutely. And, let, let me ask you, did the vi you may have said this and I missed it. Did the victim have uh, testify in the tri in both trials? She did. Um, I I never met that young woman again. I I always wondered about her, and um, she got her life together. She moved away from this area, and um, did very very well for herself. But she came back and she testified the day before me, so I never saw her. Um, but she. Okay. Uh, Go ahead. I'm sorry. But but she was. Um, but uh, she came back for the trial and, and testified. Okay, now you, you indicated that you testified. Uh, our viewers, viewers might want to, might be interested in knowing, okay, what kind of questions, uh, well, first of all, the prosecution called you as a witness, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, uh, so what kind of questions uh, did you get asked based on the evidence that you provided in this investigation? One of the things that the defense attorney needs to do to do a good job for his client is is to first of all make certain that no stone no stone is unturned and he needs to vet out you know how did you get these drawings done and there was really nothing that he, they, either attorney there were two attorneys at the table uh, one for each young man and. Um, the the only thing they could do was was to try to negate possibly 
the victim herself and again I wasn't there for her testimony but for example one of the things that they uh, they wanted to know was that um, in your training Ms. Enslow did you specifically study black features and one of the my answer to that is that there's only three skull types on the planet you have Asian African and European derived skulls each one of those and all of their nuances is important to study and that is part of the work that you do as a forensic artist um, you you learn uh, uh, to illustrate and render those those types of uh, features when someone is asking you uh, another a uh, aspect came uh, isn't it true Ms. Enslow that if you didn't grow up around any given particular ethnic group in this particular case African Americans you will have a hard time describing them and I said no not at all uh, what you remember is what you remember who you grew up with has nothing to do with what you're going to remember from a traumatic uh, is, incident. Is that what the prosecution wanted you to t say? No, the prosecution isn't even involved at this point. The prosecutor is sitting there. Uh, oh, so the defense is asking you these questions. The defense is asking me these questions. Um, hmm. What the prosecution wants to know is, what is your background? What is your training? How long have you done this? Who did you do it for? How did you come to be there? Um, how did you develop these drawings? And one of the things that the prosecutor is going to do is she's going to, he or she is going to shut off the defense by saying, did you look at booking photos before you did the drawing? And I'm going to say, no, I did not. Did you have any influence? Did the detectives give you a sense of who they think it is and how you should draw this and I say no absolutely not that's not you know that's not part of it uh, in this particular instance uh, the uh, I think the district attorney asked me those questions but before we came in before we were in, we were I was on the stand um, they want to make certain that I was sincere upfront and um, we want to show the jury that the the witness or the victim was sincere, and uh, and that's what the um, the defense attorney was hoping that maybe I saw booking photos ahead of time mm -hmm. so they could say aha that influenced you no wonder the drawing looks like uh, my you know my client. Sandy, that I, have a, I have a question. So what what uh, kind of questions are you asking the victim? Um, in order to make sure that your drawing matches exactly with uh, what they saw or the person that they saw? Well, overall, again, this was an unusual case in that I was asking the victim to draw first mm -hmm. and then I drew from that. However, in, an, in, a, in a more normal sense, in a more normal interview where the victim can draw, uh, where the victim can talk, um, I'm asking them, the shape of the face, the color of the hair, what is the hairstyle? What is it that you remember most about this person? For some people, getting to be able to talk about, I saw their eyes, their eyes were the biggest thing. You know, I noticed their teeth. It was I, their ears. Right, I feel like, I don't know, if someone goes through a traumatic situation, it's almost, it's difficult at times to try to remember exactly, you know, specific features and specific uh, details. So, is there, you know, ever an, ever an instance, I guess, where you know they might have given you the wrong information and you created a sketch that was completely different? Um, and how does that, I guess, how does how does that affect you know the case in any in any way? Well, it 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 goes to the credibility of the witness of the witness who who gave me the drawing, and um, and there may be reasons for that. Um, for example, um, she was higher than a kite when this was all going on. And um, and she's not exactly the most, you know, reliable witness to begin mm -hmm. with, or you know, pr sometimes p uh, witnesses lie to you. They outright lie, and it turns out, you know, she's the girlfriend of the guy who shot the victim. Um, so you know, you end up with somebody that has reasons for not wanting to be sincere in the first place. But everybody is different, and for some people, I've seen some people that have had not a lot happened to them and they were just shook up 
and they mm -hmm. fell to pieces. I'm probably one of those people. Um, and then I've had other people who are shot up and, you know, I've got emergency room nurses that are like, hurry up, we got to get him into surgery, hurry up. And, um, and they are pretty calm and they're pretty pissed off and they're more than willing to talk to me. Right. Uh I want to put my forensic hypnosis hat on uh, as a forensic hypnotist. One of the things we we uh, we know is that many times when a person experiences a traumatic event, event they tend to lose memory, uh, have a block of memory that's lost. Have you noticed uh, that, um, Sandy, at all? That that can happen. Uh, it's one of the reasons that professional forensic artists practice the cognitive interview. Whatever so what? image, cognitive interview. Oh, okay. Okay. And Back in the 70s when I was an investigator in the Washington area, we had a wonderful uh, forensic artist uh, at, in the Washington, D.C. Metropolitan Police Department. He, just, he did every composite uh, in, the, in the Washington metropolitan area. His name was Don Cherry. And Don was also a hypnotist. And he... Uh, he said that he never you not that he before he was even trained in hypnosis he real he realized later on that he 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 would relax his victim and you know have him take a, a couple of deep breaths and just you know and try to uh, take themselves away from the the trauma in uh, in the uh, of, in the uh, violence of the event uh, to try to calm them down uh, do you find yourself uh, again not using the word hypnosis uh, right. Uh, uh, using those kind of techniques. Yeah. No, that's very important to um, uh, have a room or a place if you can help it. You don't always get that. That you don't always have that luxury. Um, but to have a place that is fairly quiet, where there's a, not a lot of stimulation, they can focus in on what you're asking. Uh, if you're showing a, a facial identification catalog to be able to focus in and um, and and assist you in, in in developing that image, that's all really vital. We talked about the use of software that some agencies use. Is there some new technology coming down the pipe that uh, artists like yourself might consider using in the future to help you? Uh, in your skill and make it even clearer than uh, you can possibly do. Or uh, do you make a distinction between an artist, a freehand artist in in software, and that they they're two separate uh, uh, products? Um, they are two separate products, but I don't discount that there will be always new products and new programs that come out and as a forensic artist my number one commitment is to the case to the detectives that I work for and if there was a product out there that would assist and help and and could help um, I'm not opposed to that and I don't think any forensic artist is most of us at some point or another will uh, pull our drawings into Photoshop and that kind of thing but as far as facial software goes, literally, the, right now the market is there's there's a lot of there's a lot of programs out there, and there's many different um, software manufacturers. But the problem is, is that they're in the business of selling software to an agency. They're not in the business of solving crime, and um, and even as a forensic artist. I'm in the business of generating information for the detective. The detective is in the business of solving crime. Does the Ameri uh, you're a member of the American Academy of Forensic Science, as I am. Uh, yeah. Is there anything that the Academy is trying to do to assist law enforcement in being able to recognize whether a software is good, bad, or indifferent? Uh, because if, in fact, a police department doesn't have any knowledge of what's good, bad, or indifferent, right. and they're going to be they're going to be controlled by a good salesperson. And yes, they are. 
they may end up buying something. For example, uh, in the polygraph in the in the polygraph community, we got a there are two instruments being used right now: the polygraph and the voice stress analyzer. All right. right. The, vo the voice stress analyzer is. I'm I'm trying to say it nice, you know. Uh, I I can't think of any nice words to say. It's uh, it's irrelevant. Um, uh, there there's no validity in its use. But police departments are buying it because it takes 13 weeks to train a polygraph examiner, and it takes three to five days allegedly to train a voice stress. Uh, analyzer, which is you know the voice, another version of I hate to use the word lie detection, but that's the uh, uh, the easiest way to say it that our, our viewers will understand. So what I find is, in the, if you start looking at the police departments who are using the voice stress analyzer, it's because the people who made that decision from the chief on down didn't know the difference, and they simply said, hey, it's economics. I can get this person on the street using the machine because the machine, the instruments cost the same. They're about ten grand, give or take. Uh, sure. Uh, but the key is the cost of the training. You know, three to five days versus thirteen weeks, and and many times you have to even send that person somewhere, um, uh, a way to get that training. In police departments, say, hey, I don't want to pay that. So what is it that? the American Academy of Forensic Science could do, or maybe the International uh, Association of Identification uh, could do to help law enforcement in this country to at least know the differences? Um, you know, I, I think that uh, I, I think there, there's a lot here that, that um, I don't know. I don't know that, that either Group. I'm not a member of the International Association for Identification, so mm -hmm. I really can't speak for them at all. But as far as the uh, the academy goes, American Academy of Forensic Science, um, I'm not aware of anything that's being actually. This starts to push out into the commercial end of things, and um, I think that it's really up to each and every police agency to make a concerted effort to fully understand you know what they're getting involved with when they go to conventions they go in and they see a lot of smooth uh, salesmen that say hey sign up for this or sign up for that and they buy it they bring it back and they find out that it, it's too difficult for uh, for people to understand it's way over their head if if some if a law enforcement agency was to call the American Academy of Forensic Science and says, listen, I need some help. Can I talk to a forensic artist uh, to get some sense of, uh, you know, we have some money, we want, you know, we need this service. Uh, we right. don't have, we don't have a, uh, a, an, a, an employee or a police officer who has the artistic talent. Uh, would, would you or any of your colleagues in the Academy be able to help them out with some, uh, information is that, yes. is that something that's and, possible? And, yes and we do we do give them feedback we certainly give them our opinion or we refer them to uh, working forensic professionals in their area we do right. that a lot and the right. agency does uh, you know uh, at the Academy it's it's all about networking and the Academy is very good with that so great so to our listeners who uh, who are either watching tonight or will watch in the future, uh, because these shows will be up on our archived uh, channel uh, for as long as uh, Sandy and I are, are around and breathing and sucking in oxygen on a regular basis. Um, if, in fact, uh, you do need some help, uh, please contact. You can certainly contact uh, ForensicWeek.com, and we can get you to the right person or, you know, certainly uh, Sandy are uh, the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. Sandy, uh, first of all, this case, uh, what a superb job. You truly are um, uh, a professional and in, in what great talents you have. Um, uh, you know, my wife and I, my wife being um, an artist also, uh, she was looking at your art. You says, you know, I, um, I think uh, Sandy must have used some uh, software to fine-tune this. Our, uh, uh, this may not be uh, um, 
a free hint. So I know she's listening upstairs, watching the, uh, listening to the show. So um, uh, we'll have to have that discussion and say, wow. I mean, she's that good that it it, it looks that perfect. So Sandy, thank you. Uh, I know it's going to be a while uh, until we see each other. Uh, you said you were going to be uh, uh, in Florida at the American Academy meeting in fe in February. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, um both uh, Katiana Falsetti and uh, and I will be there. Good, good. Well, I look Sorry, forward no. to that. Right. And, and again, um, I want to thank you so much uh, for uh, sharing uh, that case with us. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about the uh, International Association of Identification, which is another uh, organization. In our next show, which is November 6th, the president of the International Association of Identification, uh, referred to as IAI, uh, Steve uh, Johnson, yes. uh, will be our guest. Uh, IAI is the oldest in, they say, the largest forensic association in the world, um, if they say it. Maybe they are. Uh, a, American Academy of Forensic Science may argue that, but either way, um, they are a professional forensic association, represents a diverse, knowledgeable, and experienced membership that are assembled to educate, share, critique, and publish uh, methods, techniques, and in research in the uh, physical forensic science disciplines, uh, the professional membership—it's a professional membership organization comprised of individuals worldwide who work in the field of forensic identification. So, a large group is focused on uh, obviously fingerprints. Uh, maybe, uh, well, I got to tell you something. I don't know. I am actually a member of IAI, and uh, um, and I have not—I have to admit not engaged in the organization as much as I should and I will be doing that uh, so uh, on November 6 we're gonna learn uh, in great detail all about uh, IAI and uh, what resources they have uh, for our students and uh, for our professionals meanwhile I wanna thank uh, uh, Sandy Enslow again for being on our show uh, our producer Laura Pachuki, um our uh, uh, and our new technical expert, uh, Jamal Francis, and certainly our in life, uh, in real life reporter, uh, Whitney Silva. And uh, poor uh, Mercedes Quick, she was coming in and out, so she's having some te te technical difficulties. Maybe we may have to uh, let her use the crime lab. We have a nice system in there. That's what some of our students have done in the past, so they can, she can uh, have a, uh, a good uh, clearance. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been ForensicWeek.com, being brought to you through the cooperation of the Hangout10.com live TV show network. We recommend that you go to the Hangout10.com website and see the schedule of other shows available for you to learn and be entertained. Meanwhile, thank you for watching this show, and we will see you next time on ForensicWeek.com. Bye now. I'm your host, Tom Mariello, coming to you from Laurel, Maryland, CEO of Forensic IQ Incorporated and professor at the University of Maryland, Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice in College Park. Our mission is to present real forensic-related content by real forensic professionals, and we go worldwide to find those professionals. Our goal is to broadcast topics of interest valued by an international viewership. Our vision, well-informed practitioners, mentored students, and enlightened jury pools.